Hi, Phil, and uh, thank you for attending uh, our, my first session on Casper on BI. Uh, Phil, as we all know, is a master of DAX, and uh, today's topic is DAX. Well, obviously, one of my favorite topics, too. Uh, so, hi, Phil, uh, welcome to the show uh, as our first guest. Uh, can you please do a little introduction of yourself? Sure. Hi, Casper, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's definitely an honor and a pleasure to be the um, the, the the first guest on, on what, what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic podcast. Um, so, yeah, my name's Phil Seamark. Uh, I'm based in New Zealand, so I work in the, the Antarctic outpost for Microsoft down near the bottom of the yeah. world. Um, I think this is where they send the troublemakers or, or people who, who do bad things with the, um, with the, the, with the DAX engine. Uh-huh. Um, I've... Uh, I've had a uh, BI specific roles for um, quite some time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm definitely a very lazy person, so I, I tend to look at tasks and think, you know, what's the least amount of effort that I can put in to, to get this uh, done? And um, so I, I generally get quite creative and, uh, you know, look for ways to um, use technology to, to make my life easier, um, which I think actually helps in my work life. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely fortunate, honoured, and privileged to to be part of the uh, fantastic Power BI Cat team, which is my dream job, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, you know, I get the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of true true giants. Um, uh, so I think that's probably nice. enough about me. Yeah, <laughs> and can you, can you tell us a little bit about your about the background we're seeing? The background. Okay, so this is my place. Um, I live out in the countryside in New Zealand in, in what we call over here a lifestyle block. Um, so mm. it's a big property out in the countryside that's not big enough to be a commercial farm with lots and lots of um, cows or sheep and um, sheep are very popular over here. But I do have a small number of animals, uh, sh uh, half a dozen chickens, some, nice. some you know, three sheep, and I've had cows here, pigs. It's quite fun. You know, No neighbours is, is the most important thing. But um, that view you're seeing is what I look at of what I see when I look out my window every day uh, when I come to the office, which it is looks, my home. looks amazing. I'm, I'm jealous. My view is definitely nowhere near that uh, nice. And uh, so may maybe an interesting question. Uh, so how did you get started uh, with uh, Power BI and, and, and playing around with DAX? Um, well, I first started using DAX before Power BI. So uh, DAX turned up in, in, in Excel around uh, 2009. And mm -hmm. then popped up in, in an early version of Analysis Services. This was the sort of the much fitted in memory uh, data model than, that, that came later than the multi dimensional uh, version. Yeah. And at the time, I was working very heavily with the multi dimensional version. And um, it actually took me a long time to warm to DAX. Um, it's mostly probably a reflection uh. on me. Um, I would probably try to do what I thought might be easy tasks, and I found it too hard. So I generally gave it away. And it definitely took me a few years to, um, to, to, to really. Uh, take it, take the time to seriously learn it, and uh, about probably so, five five years ago. So, so were you as deep uh, in MDX as you are in DAX now? Oh, oh absolutely, yeah, yeah, very heavily ah. deep in, in MDX. But I wasn't really part of the community, um, so uh, I, I built some quite quite large models for some very big New Zealand companies, and I really really enjoyed that. I had done a lot of software development work in the past that um, was good, but it wasn't until I started doing BI work. That I really clicked that it's this nice combination of writing code, but also seeing the effect that it can have on the business. You know, you could see yeah, that yeah. unleashing data to non-technical people to be able to easily see what was going on and, and make good decisions. Um, so it was, it was just I, I really quite enjoyed um, how, how how making providing these models and making them fast and making them useful to people, making their job really easy. Um, just um, uh, kept me in the BI world. Mm. And then about five years ago, I was working for a company uh, here in New Zealand, uh, the, the equi equivalent of eBay, um, online uh, auctions and, and trading, and, and they needed a very big um, database to keep track of all the listings and all the searches, and um, uh, you know, this was a multi-dimensional version. And we had a BI layer over the top of that, um, which at the time was SharePoint, uh, uh, Performance of Point, yeah, which you probably course. know very, very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it wasn't called Performance Point, I think it was called uh, Business Intelligence um, for, 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 for SharePoint. It was only a little corner of SharePoint and this particular company didn't even use SharePoint as their main uh, um, inter intranet product. Mm. So we installed SharePoint and we just switched on this component so that we could have uh, a web layer over the top of this MDX world and um, 
But uh, we knew we needed to upgrade that. We were happy with the, the back-end database, um, but we wanted to, to refresh and have a look for a, um, a new BI product. And around that time, Power BI had just been announced. It was very, very early version. Um, but I wanted to, we, we gave it a fair crack. And at this particular company, we ran a, a proof of concept with Power BI and a, and a couple of other very well-known uh, BI products. And um, uh, we, we weighed their pros and cons. And um, even though Power BI was quite uh, an infant, um, uh -huh. we, we decided to run with that. So I, I got in practically day one with that. And unfortunately, that meant I had to, I had to learn DAX. <laughs> um, and I, I, I do recall having some tasks which I thought were, were really, really complicated um, that I would m maybe spend three or four hours on. Uh, really, really um, trying to figure these things out, taking an awful long time and um, chew up a whole afternoon that I think probably now, because I've had the opportunity to, to, to use DAX a lot more, I, I could probably spin out in a couple of minutes. But um, yeah. that, that was my, um, my background. And yeah, as I said, it, it did actually take me a long time to warm to DAX, particularly after MDX, which I, I, I found to be a very elegant language, much um, uh, uh, much more what I was used to uh, coding with things like C sharp, etc. Yeah. Um, but but I've, I'm changed now. I love Dax. It's uh, I'm a huge fan, and um, I'm sure we'll get to that as we as we chat more about that. So so that's how I got into Power BI. Nice, nice. And uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, I mean, really, uh, everyone noticed a while ago, like last year, is all your uh, amazing Dax puzzles. Uh, <laughs> you oh. you want to quickly talk about that, and maybe you show us even. Um, yes, yes, I can do. So I I can't really remember what the motivation was. I I I was I was using the um, the community forum in uh, Power community dot com to learn DAX, um, which is a fantastic way to learn DAX if you're looking to really um, upskill quickly. Where you can go to uh, look at what people are posting, and these are challenges that you don't normally think of, and you try and solve them. Initially, the answers you put are terrible. You know, someone else puts a far better answer, and and, and you learn from that. And eventually, if you do it enough, you, you're actually putting answers that uh, help the person who posts the question. And I was doing that for a while, and um, I thought it might actually be fun to have a crack at a game. And I couldn't think of a game that um, you could write at DAX because it's not a full blown. Uh, programming language and this yeah. itself became a bit of a challenge I, I do like a challenge so my very first DAX game I had a crack at was um, I think blackjack and you can go and see this on my blog site um, dax.tips I've got a link at the top that shows you the, the, the DAX games that I did mm -hmm. and it wasn't so much a, um, an exercise in trying to produce games that people would sit for hours and play it was more just really trying to explore the and push the boundaries of DAX to try and work out how you can maybe make something really unconventional um, or, or out of the uh, out of the square, and um, so the first the first um, uh, and I'm much I'll, I'm going to have a crack at sharing my screen, Casper, if that's all right. All right, yeah. Let me quickly, yeah. They're listed here uh, on my site, and each each um, um, each listing has an article that you can go to and download the PBIX file. You can play it live, and you can read the blog that explains what were the, the challenges that I found along the way, and how did I solve them. And um, the first game I did was a, a blackjack game, where you could play one or two hands. You couldn't bet money, um, and, and, and this actually helped me learn a lot about what you could and couldn't do in, in DAX, you know, particularly around saving state and um, uh, things that you, you, you take for granted in other application programming languages. Um, and that, that, that was really enjoyable. Um, so, I, so I thought, what else could I do? And I ended up doing a hangman game. The, you can play these games. Um, there was a Minesweeper version, which you could randomly place a, a bunch of mines, and there were some quite interesting challenges in solving there. But the two that um, probably most people really enjoyed were the, uh, the two maze games. So I have a 2D maze game here that you can uh, click on and navigate a little man around a maze. And, and this takes me back to when I was younger. Playing oh, games yeah. in the um, in, in the spectrums and in the arcade halls, and I really quite enjoyed doing this in in DAX. Um, and of course, after I did a two D maze, the, the the challenge that I wanted to uh, see if I could achieve was to create a three D version of this. Um, and and I think I did a pretty good job. If I, if I throw this into full screen mode, yeah, it actually loads Power BI, yeah. 
Yeah, it loads Power BI. And um, this is based on a, um, a CSV file. So you can open and edit the CSV file to create the walls and the, um, the, the layout of your map. And if we um, click these little arrow keys here, which is just moving up and down a slicer, you can see we're moving through um, a maze. And over here in the bottom corner, <laughs> here is what's being spelled out in the CSV file. And we can turn around and uh, uh, do all sorts of things. So, so this was a kind of fun exercise in, in taking some interesting maths algorithms, uh, porting them to, to DAX, and, and allowing that to, to create a visual experience that you could navigate around. And, and, and there are some hidden slices here that allow you to cheat by flying up in the air and, and, and moving around. So, so this was a lot of fun. Um, and you can download this PBOX file off my site and pull it apart and have a play and, and, and learn and, and maybe make a maze of your own yeah. uh, logo or, or company name. So, Pretty um, cool. There is absolutely no business benefit whatsoever to this. And, and I do recall uh, showing the, um, the, the engineers who build analysis services uh, what, I, what I did here once. And they just said, you, you shouldn't be doing this to our product. This is just abusing <laughs> our product. This is not what we designed it for. Oh, yeah. Which, Made it all worthwhile, so um, it's, it's good. Yeah. Cool. Was all right. Pleased. Yeah. So that's that's pretty amazing. So let's talk DAX. And um, cool. so interesting to it would be interesting to hear from you and uh, your words, like a little bit for you to describe what DAX is in your words and what would people use it for. Okay. Um, so I think about DAX as just simply being a query language. So it's the language that allows you to construct a statement that you can fire against a, a, a database. And this particular database is um, the analysis services database, which is housed inside Power BI or, or in analysis services, um, which is a read-only database. And this particular database is not the same as the kind of database you would use for backing up an application. Um, it's optimized for analytic and uh, reporting workloads. So if you really want to understand quickly um, aggregate values of how many products did we sell this month compared to last month or, um, uh, you know, just really understanding uh, important business metrics, then it's a, it's a fantastic database to have your data in. Yeah. And DAX is the query language that lets you get at that data. And it's, it's, it is nicely designed, um, you know, to, to, to shape the data in a way that makes creating visuals really easily, whether they be bar charts, line charts, pie charts, maps, etc. So, um, mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, it's just a query language. Um, it's a functional query language. Uh, um, you just you just call functions. Functions can call functions. Function they can nest. Um, you can layer them up, but to, they're just really designed to go in quickly. Uh, yeah. and, and analysis services incredibly fast. Get the data you need um, to to create your your reports. And, uh, but um, so you said it's a query language, functional query language, but we all know uh, it also contains like calculated columns and things like this. Uh, what would you say about that? Like uh, when would, so maybe you should, uh, you should ask the question a little bit different. When would you use them? Okay, okay. So um, there are three main calculation types that you have when you can write DAX. You can use DAX to create a calculated table. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use DAX to create a calculated column. But also, you can create, you can use DAX to create a measure, and they, you would use them, and they have different pros and cons. And um, uh, when obviously you write a, a DAX expression that um, it, uh, creates a table, when you run it, um, uh, what, what, once the once it completes, there you have you have a nice table in your model that you can join to other tables and write measures over and add calculated columns to. If you write DAX to um, you know uh, add a column to your table, much like you might do in Excel. Then you can write a little DAX formula, and, and bang, you can have a number that happens to be the the value of price times quantity. Um, yeah. You know that's 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 your common calculated column. But the one that probably makes DAX come alive is the calculated measure. So this is where you can quickly summarize, um, you know, the 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 entire um, sum your sales and, and count your um, transactions uh, super quickly over many billions of rows of data. Um, and, and we have to remember that. Analysis Services is an in-memory database, so it's very, very fast. It uses some very clever compression tri tricks to um, mean that when you when you run your query, it's just amazingly fast how, how quickly you can get a result out of DAX. Um, um, yeah. So, yeah. 
And so uh, the, the always has been the debate uh, since Power Query came along is where do you do what? Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. So uh, when I'm doing presentations, particularly on DAX, um, a common question practically every time is when should I perhaps write a formula or a calculation in Power Query and when should I do one in DAX? Yeah. Um, Power Query is a language really optimized for data manipulation. Um, so it's, it's a bit like shaping your query. So anything to do with uh, manipulating your data into the right shape. Mm -hmm. And you should really be trying to strive to get your data into that classic star schema, which we won't dive into. But um, you know, if, you, if you can have your data model in a star schema um, structure, then, um, yeah. then you're going to make your life easier. But not all data comes in that format. So Power Query is fantastic at helping manipulate your data without having to write much code. You know, 90% of the time, all you're doing is pressing buttons. You're not writing the underlying M language, which is fantastic. So you can pivot data, you can group data, you can you know, add columns, remove columns, and get the data into the right shape. Um, and then once your data is in the right shape, then DAX can take over, and that is especially good at performing the calculations that you would want to do at runtime in your, in your measure, in, in, your, in your report. Um, you can do data manipulation um, uh, work using DAX, but it's probably not the best. Um, so if, if you need to add, if you need to change the physical layout of your data, then it's probably best to be done in Power Query. Get the data right, and then once you're in DAX, simple DAX should be good DAX, uh, where you just simply do sums yeah. and counts and, and averages and, and a little bit of manipulation to do things like period comparisons and running totals and ratios, etc., things like that. So. Um, there are a couple of things that it makes sense to do. Well, you, should, you could do it in either. Creating a date table is practically no different. There, there are pros and cons about either, but um, mm. yeah, yeah. The, the way I always like to tell it as well is like if you need to reach to data that is sitting inside of your model, the only way yeah. you can do it is with DAX. Yeah, you can kind of use it with Power Query. So yeah, yeah good tips. Yeah. So um, so let's say I'm a listener and I want to get started with DAX. What do I do? Where do I go? Okay, um, I, I'd recommend a multifaceted approach. There's a whole bunch of fantastic resources out there, and they're practically all free. Um, you know, some mm -hmm. people like books. Um, there are some wonderful blogs, some great video blogs. I, I'd absolutely recommend Guy on a Cube. They've got a huge library of uh, videos, short five-minute videos that tell you practically anything about how to do anything in Power BI, including a whole bunch of things on DAX. Yeah. I personally learned a lot, um, as I mentioned earlier, from community.powerbi.com. Um, so I went to the forums and I just simply read some of the questions that people were posting saying, look, how do I do a period comparison? You know, How do I do this running total? And I would look at the answers other people would put. And I, I, I eventually got brave enough to start putting my own answers in. And um, that was a, a big part of how I learned how to do DAX. And I was exposed to challenges that I wouldn't normally think of. Um, mm. like in, in, in my day job, I, I had had to solve some problems and I figured them out but in, in community.powerbi.com you know I learned a lot um, I also probably recommend if you've got a reason in your personal life like a hobby or, or um, uh, a pet project that you maybe try and build a project using Power BI and, and DAX because quite often that's a good way to learn when, when it's in your time um, and you go I can make this better by adding this column or adding this metric or or whatever and again you what you're doing is, is you're you're forcing yourself to be exposed to a problem that you wouldn't normally be exposed to and then you have to try and solve that now you could go back to community.powerbi.com post in the forums and ask for ideas and you'll definitely get some fantastic ideas there are some great contributors and posters there that um, that uh, know more more about DAX than I do absolutely um, they're, they're great over there um, training. There's uh, some really good online training, uh, both um, uh, um, in, in person. Um, I, I would highly recommend going to the Microsoft Learning uh, platform. We've recently updated and released a new suite of DAX modules there. There's about a two-hour learning path with about seven modules, which again is all free that walks you through um, the basics. It's not going to make you an expert, but um, uh, I, I'd highly recommend uh, searching for the DAX on the Microsoft Learning Platform. Uh, absolutely, Casper's blog, <laughs> my uh -huh. blog, anything by um, Marco Russo or, or um, uh, Alberto Ferrari. They, they've just been doing this for so long. They've got a huge amount of experience and they explain things really well. Um, so I would highly recommend anything by those guys. Um, plus, you know, if, if you see uh, MVP tag 
um, on someone's blog or presentation, they're, they're typically people that uh, know their stuff and, and probably can explain it in a really good way too. So I'd, I'd just suggest a mixture of those things. Um, everyone's different, but I probably found personally I learned the most by going to community.powerbi.com and you're also giving back as well. So I recommend, um, I highly recommend having a look at that if you haven't. So. All right, cool. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. So we give everyone a lot of homework. Um, so um, maybe it's also an interesting question because you see a lot of them, you work with a lot of customers uh, who yep. do DAX things. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes you see people doing? Yeah, so my role in the CAT team, I, I kind of get called the DAX guy. And that's mostly because no one else in the team wants to do it. <laughs> um, but that's fine with me. So what I tend to do is I, I generally get involved in customers who are having data modeling or DAX problems, which I, I do really enjoy, actually. And it's uh, so I, I do get exposed to some interesting uh, problems. And some of the more common things I see are not getting the data model right. Um, so, so people who perhaps try and replicate the table and re uh, relationship structure to match what they get from the, the core application that they're trying to do BI over the top of. So it's what we might call the OLTP or um, uh, um, the, the, the data structures designed for that, as opposed to converting it to a star schema or, or just optimized for OLAP. So if, if you get your data model right, that goes a long way to making the rest of your journey, building Power BI reports and, and, and building quick analytics a lot easier. So you know, I highly recommend taking the time and effort to design a, a good clean data model um, Absolutely, um, uh, making sure that the data model is optimized. If you look at powerbi.guidance, there's a whole bunch of tips there. But quite often I see models that are very, very large and they're complaining about it being too big and not fitting in the memory yeah. that they've got allocated. And, and, and you get the opportunity to have a look and you see, well, 80% of these columns are just not being used. They're, they're string columns or they're, they're identity columns. And you can remove a bunch of columns and the model can still provide exactly the same reporting functionality as what, the previous version does but it might be a fraction of the size and and that makes refreshing and managing backing up and restoring all these things so much easier so um uh, reducing the the you know getting rid of unnecessary columns getting rid of unnecessary rows um getting your data types right um hinting back to data modeling stuff you know making sure you don't do things like you know joining fact tables to fact tables they're probably the most common common things i see um, yeah yeah and, I, I mean one of the things i see regularly is that they just move the data into the model the way that they get it, yeah. like from CSV files, exactly. and then they start fixing the problems with DAX. Like, yeah. okay, we're yeah. trying to fix all the, the modeling problems with DAX, and then they say DAX is hard, but yeah, I mean, you're getting yourself into big trouble here. Yeah, and, and, the, and the two other things I've got is like not using time intelligence properly, so not, not using a, a date table correctly the way it's meant to be used, and taking advantage of the um, the DAX time intelligence functions. People try and do time intelligence in, in other ways and it be becomes very inefficient. And finally, you're trying to do too much in DAX that if you don't get the data model right, it means you end up writing DAX functions that are, um, or DAX measures that are, you know, 10 or 12 lines when they should only be two or three lines. And generally the two or three lines DAX functions on top of a good model are always the most efficient. And mm. um, you know, when you've got a model that's being used by a lot of people, um, you know, they, you know, it can make a big difference getting a, a five-second query down to you know, a fraction of a, a quarter of a, a second. Um, so, so the, they're probably my the biggest things that I see that um, that uh, pop up most often. All right. Cool. So, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, when you write DAX in general, are there some patterns you follow? Are there some some things that you always do, like use variables or something, or uh, look, look, number one is always formatting the query. And you'll be surprised how often I will see very, very long DAX uh, measures that just have no formatting whatsoever. And, um, you know, I find if I go out and put in carriage returns and tabs, etc., uh, it takes me a little while, um, mm -hmm. but it helps, helps me absorb what's going on in the measure and, and the calculation and what the person was in, in trying to do. So certainly formatting, adding comments, and... Um, yeah, it, yeah, probably variables will be the next thing, and which harks back to your previous question about um, common um, errors I see is, is not making good use of variables as well. Um, so, um, and do you use, yeah. uh, and, the, and the other thing I... You know that's the tool, right? Uh, do you ever use the DAX formatter? 
Marco Lomberto. Dex format. I, I probably don't use that enough. I do huh. it by hand, but that's a personal preference for me to take the time to read what someone else is doing. Oh, yeah, I probably that makes sense. should. Um, but then I use Dex Studio heavily. So I really, really heavily use Dex Studio. So if I am cop- copying and pasting stuff into there, uh, you know, I hit the format um, uh, Dex uh, button oh, on yeah. the toolbar. And, you know, that's just amazing about how much cleaner and easier it is to read and absorb and, and, and figure out what's going on. So, um, yeah. but absolutely, you know, formatting is essential. It doesn't speed it up at all. Variables can do, but um, for maintenance and, and management, and it's, you, 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 you're doing yourself a favor because if you write some decks and you don't look at it for three months and you come back and you're going to scratch your head and wonder oh. what's going on. So, uh, so, you, so, so you're talking about maintenance. Do you use comments? Yeah. I do, uh-huh. probably not as much as I should. Yeah, well, that's, that's everyone's answer. I, I used to be a developer a long time ago. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I, I probably was a little bit arrogant in my younger days thinking that it's self-commenting, the, the code is the comment, but um, mm. I, I have definitely been burnt by that and oh, yeah. caught out by that. So it did, you, it's even for yourself as you get older, um, just to remind yourself, what were you intending to do with this little piece of snippet? can go a long way with just a couple of words. It doesn't have to be a novel, but um, one or two comments will, will definitely do your, your future self some favors. Yeah, if, sure. um, if, if I want to channel my inner Matthew. Uh, yes. <laughs> all right, so formatting, uh, variables, <laughs> those, are, those are all important things. Um, so the last time you solved the DAX performance problem, how did you approach it? Yeah, so, so what I tend to do, uh, when a customer sends me a report page and, and, and they maybe say, this is taking too long to run, like maybe it takes 50 seconds to, to complete. Yeah. Um, so what I, what, t- what I typically do is um, open the report in Power BI Desktop and turn on the Performance Analyzer tool that we, we added uh, over a year ago. Mm-hmm. And um, that will tell me uh, how long each visual takes to, to load. And I'm particularly interested in how long does the DAX component. And you can actually sort that now and say, Show me what was the um, which which visual on the page took the longest time to compute the DAX. Yeah, because often it's only one or two visuals in there, and then you can start zeroing in on that. You can capture that de- DAX, excuse my accent, from the performance analyzer and take it over to DAX Studio. You know, one of the things we're, we're blessed with is um, these community third-party tools. They, they they're built by the community. They they know what what um, uh, what works and what what um, what's helpful. And then when you take the query over to DAX Studio, there's a number of things that you can uh, enable. Um, uh, the, the first thing I go for is the server timings button in the DAX Studio. And I have done some videos on this. Well, I think other people will, will do video that, um, blogs on this too. And that can tell you a lot about what's happening on the internals for the DAX statement when it's being run. <clears throat> and I personally, I quite often look for the number of storage engine scans that, that normally has a fairly strong correlation to the performance of the query. Yeah. And um, I mean, if you've got a complex DAX query that's only taking about five or six storage engine scans, that's probably doing a pretty good job. But uh, often I can uh, run one of these and it might take two or three hundred storage engine scans. And you know, I'm trying to optimize that down to um, you know, only a handful. Uh, recently, I had a, I had one that was over thirty thousand oh, wow. storage engine scans, and and um, yeah, I, I managed to get that down to about twelve. And obviously, the query performed really well as well. Now, I'm not going to dwell on you know the the, the theory and the art of that, um, mm-hmm. but but typically that's what I'm looking for. So, is it, and, uh, it, is there any quick hint on how you gather from thirty thousand to a handful or ten? <clears throat> Well, normally what, what, I, what I start doing is old school debugging. So I start commenting out lines of DAX and seeing uh, when, if, if I've commented out this particular line and all of a sudden when I rerun the um, query, yeah. it's, it's the, the number of storage engine scans or the timing comes down to next to nothing. I like, aha, I know it's quite possibly involved in this particular line. Because and, often um, it's nested, it's right? Visual. Often it's Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you can use DAX Studio to... to you know, bring all that code to the um, to the window, and um, it's not uncommon for that to be a distinct count type calculation. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there are ways that you can restructure or just rearrange the uh, the query. Often, just introducing variables will will help. Um, and, and then experience probably helps a lot too, because I have again done plenty of times on in, in the community I know that if I, I I can rewrite this particular calculation. 
uh, even sometimes six different ways and just try out uh, instinct. I often have a good instinct after doing it for so long. What probably will work better and I'll try it out and benchmark, retest, benchmark, retest and, and, and I find the one that works. Yeah. But you also do have to be careful that what what is just um, uh, DAX expression for that particular data set might not necessarily be the same on a different data set. So if mm. you're working on a dev environment which only has a fraction of the rows of production, you, you, you still have to you know bear that in mind. But typically the approach is, as I mentioned, start with the performance analyzer, get the query over to DAX Studio where you can use the fa functions and features of DAX Studio to go through and, 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 and zero in in little baby steps to try and find out the isolation the part that's probably causing the problem and um, you know see what you can do there so that's that's the high level approach that I um, that I take when I'm, I'm, I'm drilling down but yeah. um, lots of so debugging some, sometimes yeah but sometimes it's just looking at the data model first and saying hey you know you need to get rid of these columns and, and, and maybe rearrange the data in a different format and um, you're not doing much in the DAX world at all apart from simplifying it because you can throw away a whole little DAX and still get the same result by um, running it over a cleaner data model. Mm. So yeah, this, yeah. less DAX is often better DAX. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. All right, cool, thanks. Um, so let's have a little fun. So let's talk about DAX functions. So what's your favorite DAX function? This, this is a, yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, I really like the iterator functions. So these are all the ones with the X after the name. Oh, um, the dangerous so ones. Some X and the dangerous ones, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But in particular, concatenate EX or concatenate X, you can do some quite fun things with. <clears throat> and probably combined with the generate function, um, you can do some really nifty on the fly pivoting. And uh, I use those heavily in my games. I used them when I was doing some um, quite interesting uh, approximate distinct count work, which I'll probably mm -hmm. mention in a bit. I did some blog posts on how to do things like convert decimal to hexadecimal and, and back, which I needed to use for and some other things as well and, and yeah. i and i found quite often it helped to be able to pivot columns to rows and rows to columns on the fly in dax and i couldn't do this in power query because this was uh you know had to respect slices and, and filters that were um the user had, had, <clears throat> had played so it, it feels like with a combination of concatenate x and generate you can really mm -hmm. start to do some real coding um so and 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 probably variables i think it's not a function um, but those three things combined, uh, you can really do some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I don't think I've ever done like generate concatenate X stuff. It sounds right. interesting. Well, yeah, concatenate X is, is a really good debugger for the other iterator. Well, that, yeah, yeah, yeah those so, are so, if you, so if you're ever wondering why you're not getting the right result when you're doing a rank X, which is really, really common, mm -hmm. um, just by substituting the rank X function with concatenate X, you can actually see what the rank X is, at, is working with in every single cell. And uh, often that is, aha, I, I know what's happening when you can visually see. So I, I do use concatenate, EX, concatenate X as a bit of a debug function yeah. for other other um, iterator functions. And, and probably rank X mm -hmm. is the, the one you're most likely to have a fun with. Or, or totals, subtotals and grand totals with um, some X often trips people up as well. They get the right result when they look at it in the row, mm -hmm. but um, the total's doing something really strange and bizarre. And um, converting the function to concatenate X can be that aha moment where you, yeah. where you know what is being considered and what isn't being considered. And then you can make the adjustment in, the, um, in, your, in, your, in your expression, so. Makes sense. And then, so now, what's the least favorite or the, most, the one that causes most trouble? Probably cross-join. Now, cross-join uh -huh. is exactly the same as generate. And you're going to ask, why, why? You've just told me that generate's your favorite. Yeah. What, what? Because they, they, they do produce the same output. In fact, cross-join's more useful because cross-join, you can tell it to cross-join multiple tables. But um, cross-join uh, uh, can be very, very um, uh, memory inefficient, if that's a proper word. Uh, so it's not uncommon if you're having a look at a, the memory profile of a, a model that's struggling and, and you see a chart where the memory just maxes up and you dig in and you find the query that's been run, that cross-join is somewhere in there. So just simply actually um, keeping the intention and replacing cross-join with generate, mm -hmm. you get the same output, but it's much more memory efficient. So I think I think generate came much later and um, was written in a, in a, in a yeah. way that um, didn't chew up so much memory. So if you've got cross-join anywhere in your code, I, I probably recommend you um, review that and, and possibly substitute with uh, generate, especially if you're having memory problems. 
So yeah, which that is would common. be my least yeah. favourite. I, I don't see it very often. So it's, it's no, but I mean, me memory problems are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cross join and distinct count would be the two that um, really put a, a, a data model under pressure in, 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 in any BI system. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and there are genuine use cases for, for them. So. so maybe that ties into the next one. So what's the hardest DAX challenge you've ever had? Yeah, well, I, I do get pretty interesting challenges through my role in the CAT team. Yeah. And, you know, I might get exposed to a model that, hey, this is taking a long time to run. And you sit down and have a look. And I'm not kidding. It could be measure calling, measure calling, measure calling, measure, layered through 30 or 40 layers. And it can take a long time just to try and figure out how it all hangs together. And that can be a real mental challenge, um, which sometimes I'm up for if I've, if I've had plenty of caffeine. Um, you know, these can be one, some of the most fun, yeah. but um, otherwise they can also give you a real, real headache. Um, probably the, 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 the challenging ones were those games, um, even though they weren't directly BI related. And I think in particular the Minesweeper game, um, trying to solve the problem of when you click on a square that uh, is a blank square, how do we reveal what is a really, really uh, irregular shape? And I... I knew I wanted to do it, and it took me a couple of weeks um, before I sat bolt up uh, upright one night in bed, three o'clock in the morning, and I literally said, Eureka, <laughs> I, I solved it for some reason. I'm, everyone has these moments. Um, yeah. And I got out, got out of bed, and, and, uh, and, I, and I finished it off, and I was really, really happy with that. But, I mean, the details are in the blog, but um, I thought that was a particularly challenging. And obviously, the 3D one was satisfying too. Yeah. Um, because you know that's not trivial stuff. You know the, the 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 measure is many many lines of code, and 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 having to to figure out the concept of perspective and um, you know where all the data points are and drawing them in the right order. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Uh, even though surprisingly that only took about two hours to write. Um, although that was built on top of the two D version I had done easily uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, and and probably the last one that was really interesting was. The, there's a concept and there's, there's, there's a challenge we have in very, very large models, um, uh, again with distinct count, mm -hmm. um, to, to get it to perform efficiently. And I was aware that you had, there was a concept of approximate distinct count mm -hmm. that I knew yeah. was based on an algorithm um, called HLL or HLL++. Um, that's just some quite clever mathematics. It, it takes some smart shortcuts to be able to arrive at a number which is incredibly close. Mm -hmm. um, a few decimal points, much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2%, plus or minus 2%. But it can do it very quickly without using anywhere near as much memory. And in Power BI or Index, we do have a function called approximate distinct count, but all that does is shell out to, um, if your database is SQL or um, uh, the Synapse, it just cheats, it, gives, it passes it down to a function that they have in the SQL database. But we didn't have it in AS. Yeah. So I thought, I might see if I can figure out if, if I can do this in DAX. And um, so I spent some time learning the algorithm and, you know, pulling it apart and trying it in, in, in different ways. In it. And I figured out how to um, uh, solve this in a way so you could have a table with 50 billion rows of data. And, you know, this could be user activity on, um, on, a, on a very busy system. And if you want to understand how many unique users did we have last month versus the pr previous month, you know, I, I sort of came up with a solution which was a lot faster than actual distinct count and was, was oh, yeah. surprisingly accurate. So, and, so I really enjoyed it. And how much that. faster was it? Oh, um, it's on my blog. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, on, on the, the larger the data set, the better it was. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I, for the, I think it was a query that might have taken five minutes was, was running in like five seconds and, and being incredibly accurate. Um, so the, and, and using nowhere near as much memory, so mm. it could be run regularly. Um, so so nice. And, and that was non-trivial. That was really getting into the bones of an algorithm and pulling it apart and finding out which bits work best to put where and and and, and using DAX. And surprisingly, it wasn't a lot of DAX. It was probably only about ten or twelve lines. But it's the modeling. Once I was right? able to boil it right down. Um, and it's not a solution I would apply to every single model. But where where you do have a lot of data and you do have to have this um, approximate distinct count. It can can really make a difference to to your end users, and I and I'm aware of um, quite a few people who have applied it. They've mm. read, they read the blog, 
they applied it on the model and they reported back and they said, you know, this actually was this worked really well. So that's really satisfying to hear. You know, if, if you do try it and it works for you, let me know. If it doesn't work for you, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're going to have to spend more time. All right, so, so maybe a little bit uh, and we'll dive into this topic uh, in a later show as well. But oh. aggregations, I know you're a big fan and you've been working with it quite a lot. How does this yeah. change DAX slash modeling, especially in those actually probably for the majority of the cases, this might be interesting, but especially on those larger enterprise models? Okay, so in my earlier days when I worked on multi-dimensional or MDX, mm -hmm. AGs were essential. Oh, they yeah. were just if you didn't have the AGs there, the performance would be dire. That that company I worked for that I was telling you about, the eBay of, of New Zealand, um, when I first walked into their uh, my day one, they had a multi-dimensional model where they didn't have AGs, and the average query time was five minutes. Oh. I switched on AGs because it was part of the product, fantastic feature. Yeah, and query times were practically instant. Um, now, when the tabular version, the in-memory version of, of um, analysis services came along, I obviously wasn't part of Microsoft, but I, I think mm -hmm. the thinking at the time was, this is in-memory, this is really fast, we probably don't need AGs. Yeah, uh, I was there, so yes, that's guess. true. Yeah. And, and, and I think what's happened is over time is people are, are starting to throw much, much bigger data sets at this fantastic engine. And yes, memory is very, very quick. Um, but we need AGs. Um, so, so borrowing and taking what those learnings from the multi-dimensional days and, and, and seeing them apply to the tabular is, is um, I think, now essential. Uh, although even medium-sized models, I think, really benefit from, from even a handful of aggregations, yeah. um, especially if it's a model that's got a lot of visibility. You know, if you've got half your company regularly hitting a particular model, the more aggregations and summary tables you can build into that, the better. And of course, we have the ag, ag awareness feature in analysis services or, or Power BI that can help match um, and allow you to do it in a nice, elegant way. And you know, I am working on a, on a, on some improvements that are coming up with um, with Power BI that can hopefully make adding aggregations to to these models uh, more automatic, uh, based on what your users are doing. And that, that's a lot of fun helping design that. So being being hands on and um, helping shape that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so, I, I I I think they're essential. I don't think they're just for large enterprise models. Yeah, I think uh, medium sized models will definitely benefit from them, and the more people using your model, the more uh, the more it will benefit from having having aggregations. Even four row aggregations uh, would, would be useful. And I mean, it saves making it easier and easier. Even if just the simple in the simple the best part of the equation is it saves money. Like if you have your premium capacity up mm. and running, and uh, and it's a two gig model. And everyone, as you yep. said, like hundreds of people are hitting it. It's going to cost energy. It's going to cost CPU. It's going to cost memory. If you create a li little simple aggregation table that just eats up like sixty percent of your queries, I mean, it's yep. a, it's a, it's a massive gain. First of all, it's going to be faster. Uh, it's, it's going to be more easier to hit if people are just adding visuals on your on your report, like. 20, 30, 40, it's easier to hit. So yeah, I, mean, I definitely agree with that. And yeah, if, if, I was, if I was building a model for uh, people in our organization that I knew a lot of us at Microsoft were going to be using, I would absolutely use aggregate. I would include aggregate tables in the model w without question. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't. And then, so, okay. And maybe a little bit of follow-up for that is uh, also, uh, we have another amazing new feature, calculation groups. How does that uh, change? DAX, does it change DAX? Is it going to be making? It certainly makes some. Yeah, yeah. It certainly makes some tasks uh, a lot easier. I mean, the primary um, rule, the, the primary usage of calculation groups it helps reduce the number of measures that you have. Again, I see really common practice where um, I look at a customer model and they have a large number of measures, mm -hmm. but the measures are just carbon copies of each other. They're yeah. just uh, the, they might have six columns in their main fact table that are numeric columns and on each column they have a year-to-date measure and some period comparisons and some running totals and they have a they have a lot of measures it's, it's what we call uh, measure sprawl mm -hmm. and, and calculation groups go a long way to simplify the number of DAX expressions you need to add to your model to provide the end user with the experience they need to be able to um, explore and do all these rich um, uh, calculations on the model so first and foremost they they make though that a lot easier um, but there are also some quite other neat things that um, you can do with calculation groups. 
like dynamic measure switching, um, you know, currency, currency conversion. On format the fly. strings. Um, yeah, format strings are, are, are fantastic. Um, I mean, I, I have to admit, it's a bit of a shame we don't have a UI for that yet mm-hmm. in Power BI yeah, Desktop, totally so it would be nice to see that come along at some point. But, um, you know, you can use the community tools like Tabular Editor to add them. Um, so you know, calculation groups, I, I, I think they're a bit of a... Uh, an, an unsung hero a little bit in the analysis services world. So if you haven't um, played with them, I, I definitely recommend looking at them. And in fact, the other day I had someone, uh, I, I received an email at uh, nine o'clock at night and they was, they were, you know, hey Phil, I'm struggling with this thing. Here's the pattern. And it was quite a long piece of um, uh, code. And I sort of looked at it, didn't really look at it too deeply. And I said, hey, just try calculation groups. I, I replied three minutes later. And I got a reply about a week later saying, hey, we did that, it was fantastic, it worked much faster, we're happy, we love it, you know, and um, that was really satisfying, especially because I was lazy and I didn't really put too much effort in, but calculation groups, yeah, they, they solved that one. Nice, I, nice, I, nice. I shared it with the engineers who, who built calculation groups, um, and, and they really appreciated that feedback too, so. Good, cool. All right, so that leads us to the last uh, question. Uh, it can be long, but uh, what yeah. else would you like to share about DAX? Like, is there anything you want to give them, give everyone as a takeaway? No, I just, I mean, DAX is incredibly powerful. You know, it's, it's, it's what you can do with DAX. I mean, you saw the maze. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you know, when, when people complain to me and say, hey, I'm really struggling to get this number to show up in this line in, in, in the visual, and, you know, I don't think DAX can do it. Um, and, and I show them the, the 3D maze, you know, it's like, no, you can do anything with DAX. Mm. And, um, in my local user group, people will come to me and say, hey, I've got this really problem. Can you do it in DAX? I automatically answer, yes, of course you can do it in DAX. The, the challenge is learning it. That's, that's the hard part. Yeah. Um, and and I, again, I recommend going to community.powerbi.com to learn. Um, another tip I probably might suggest is if you've come from a SQL background, like if you have done a lot of work with um, SQL, um, it's DAX is actually surprisingly similar. While it's not similar in syntax, it's quite similar in structure. And if you often think, how would I solve this problem using SQL statements, quite often what you end up doing logically in DAX is very, very similar. So that's possibly a tip for, especially for those people who, who, who've done a bit of SQL work in, 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 in their days gone by, like I did, actually. That's, yeah. um, and, and one of the books I wrote was actually uh, Beginning DAX for... Uh, Power BI uh, for the SQL professional, and and I had a lot of stuff in in the book. You know, here's the here's the problem. Here's how you do it in DAX, and here's the equivalent SQL. So you can kind of map across. Mm. Um, hopefully, if you've done a bit of SQL there. Um, what else would I share? Just absolutely, aggregations are underused. Calculation groups are underused. Um, and, and look, DAX does feel hard. Yeah. Uh, I, I get stuck. I trip up. I I, I trip up regularly. Um, so if you do make a mistake or, or if it doesn't feel like you're learning, that's not you. That's just, um, uh, the, it's a technical, um, it's a technical thing. And, and, and one of the things about DAX is there aren't that many jobs around where you sit and do DAX all day, exactly, every day. Exactly. That's what I was going to say um, too. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, whereas other languages like SQL, there are plenty of jobs where you can get a job just doing SQL for 40 hours a week. You know, I did that for a long, long time. And when you're doing that, you know, you can really learn and get deep into the language. But the, the thing about DAX is you can write a measure, a couple of lines, bang, that's all you have to do for a couple of weeks, and then you can kind of forget everything. And I think that does definitely make the learning curve slower yeah. because you're not doing it in, in, in and out. And that's probably a good thing because you can solve things very, very quickly. But um, I, I, I think that's often a reason why people say maybe DAX feels hard. but yeah. It's, it, believe me, if I can if I can do DAX, um, you can do DAX. Uh, it's no harder than SQL. It is one of those things that you just the more you practice, the more you um, mess around with it, then um, definitely the better you'll get. All right, and with that, thank you for your time, Phil. I think it was uh, amazing. We got a lot of uh, good uh, insights, and uh, and uh, we've all learned from it. I hope so. Thank you for your time, and uh, we'll look. No, thank you for inviting me, and I'm really looking forward to the um, the, the future version, the future blogs as well, the, the podcast. Yes, um, I've, I've seen the list, and I'm really excited about that. So, oh, all right, cool. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening. No problem. All right. See you later. All good right. night, everyone. See you. Bye bye. And with that, we've ended our first episode of Casper on BI. 
I hope you've enjoyed it and maybe learned a thing or two. Uh, and I'm planning to do this more often. And I'm planning to tackle much more topics uh, from data warehousing to more DAX, of course, much more Power BI, data visualization, and talk to experts uh, that, that allow us to learn and see how Power BI is implemented. This episode will be available on both YouTube and as a podcast, so you can listen to it from anywhere. Walking outside, hopefully in the sun, and enjoy, but at the same time learn from the best people in the industry. Thanks for attending, and hopefully I'll see you next time.